right? Alright. Hello everyone, welcome to track two. Sean, if you don't know me, I'm the DJ of the track today. I hope everyone's having a great time. It's great to see you when you're in person and not being virtual this year. Amazing. Uh, so we really do want to appreciate everyone coming out. Our next speaker here is Craig Faulkner. He's a lead sales engineer for Cyber Reason. He's going to give us a great talk on ransomware decoded. So for their group, a brief round of applause for Craig. Can you hear me if I stand this far away? Yeah, good, all right. You may, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. So today, I wanna to talk about ransomware, so a uh, brief little uh, bio here for you. So it, as Sean mentioned, I am a lead sales engineer here at Cyber Reason. Uh, my day-to-day -day is interfacing with customers like yourself uh, to help defend against the adversary. So we focus on detection response as well as uh, prevention and being able to understand what's happening in an environment and correlate it across the enterprise. So what we really focus on is the ability to see uh, a timeline of an attack as it's occurring, both pre-breach and post-breach, so that way we can understand how the threat actor is, is occurring in your environment um, in, instead of getting multiple alerts, right? We try to correlate everything into a single alert and give you actionable and intelligible information um, so that's my quick little cyber reason pitch. Happy to talk, we've got a booth out there. Happy to talk more with you guys um, after the fact. But today I really wanna focus on, um, on, uh, on ransomware. And I think we all know that ransomware is a huge problem. It's only gotten worse since probably 2015, 2016. So just a quick, real quick rundown. I wanna talk about the history of ransomware. It's actually a really unique story um, with ransomware, how it's evolved, and really when the first ransomware occurred, uh, that a lot of people weren't aware of, so I always like to touch on it. Um, talk about why ransomware. Why is it the threat actors use ransomware? Talk about some techniques they use with double extortion, blackmail. Um, talk about a few insights and trends, things we've seen recently from our threat research teams as well as research teams across the cybersecurity industry. Talk about the golden age of ransomware. So I think we've seen definitely in 2020 and now even into 2021 as we look at even the last few months, uh, that we are really in that golden age of ransomware and what can we do about it to help defend our enterprises. And then lastly, as I just alluded to, what actions can you take to defend your environment? So let's talk about the history real quick. So what's interesting about this slide is that in 1989, was actually the first time that we really recognized ransomware. And so if you don't know this story, uh, it's a gentleman by the name of Joseph Klopp, and he was at the um, World AIDS Organization, um, and what they did, they had a big conference, and he actually printed, um, it was like 400 and something uh, floppy disks. So imagine 1989, right, so floppy disk. And what he did is he wrote software that when you put it into a drive, a floppy disk drive on a computer, it actually encrypted it. And it had a message that said that you had to pay $189 and had a location to an offshore account, um, much like we see today. Uh, but he actually did it back in 1989, and that was the first time that we really saw that. And then obviously as the computer industry evolved in the 90s and 2000s, ransomware, you can see, really jumped up back to, you know, to 2013. So we really didn't see much between then, if we did, it wasn't you know uh, a huge impact to make the news. But back in 1989, he is now considered the father of ransomware. So um, definitely encourage you to go read more about it. There's a lot of news articles about um, Joseph Klopp and the things that he did. Um, but he he founded ransomware. So as we move on to the, the evolution, again we see in 2013 with Crypto Locker. Um, there's some other things in here with Petya. Uh, Wanna Cry? Does anybody remember Petya and Wanna Cry 2016, 2017? Raise your hands. Yeah. Uh, difficult times. I was actually on the customer side at the point, so I had not come over to the sales side just yet. Uh, I was dealing with that in a large healthcare organization, so I definitely uh, know how that was. That's in 2017, we saw 2017 uh, yeah, Ryuk evolve, um, and then some others as well. And then I think if we look into uh, now into 2020 as well now into 2021. Uh, there's some things that we've seen where these third actors are evolving and they're getting smarter. If we look at some things from just from the past few months in this year, um, JBS, Kaseya, uh, the Half-Name Attacks, SolarWinds, 
all of these that are making big news now that we're seeing that ransomware is a problem. It's not going away, and we need to do something about it. I think that, you know, probably our mindset back in 2016, 2017 was that, okay, if we mitigate this now, you know, we'll be good coming in the future. Unfortunately, ransomware has become such a commodity in the industry uh, that we just don't see it going away. So why is it that attackers even use ransomware? Well, one, there's kind of three um, things that we look at in regards to when they run a malware campaign, specifically a ransomware campaign. One, you want to look at the impact. How is it going to affect who you're targeting, uh, who you're going after? I think we saw in the you know mid 20, you know 2015, 2016 with uh, ransom with uh, Ryuk, with WannaCry, all of those. Uh, it was more of that. And we'll talk about more here in a little bit the spray and pray, right? So deploy this malware, deploy the ransomware to just whoever we can and hope that somebody pays the ransom. And we've really evolved to more of a, a targeted approach where the threat actors are targeting uh, specific companies, specific individuals. So we look at the impact. We also look at the complexity. Uh, as you guys know, it's not, it's not uh, very easy to develop a malware necessarily, um, but nowadays you can actually go buy malware. You can go buy a ransomware campaign, and we'll talk more about that as well. So we look at the complexity of it, and then we also look at the popularity. What type of malware campaigns are being used? How are they being used, and are they effective? And if they're effective and popular, then let's use it. After we look at these three things, then we can really start to look at who is doing this. So the first one is cyber criminals. I think this is very obvious. We all know that there's people out there that are really trying to just make a dollar, right? They are going to deploy malware, they want people to pay a ransom, and they want you to uh, be able to encrypt your data so that way they can make you pay and they can make money off of you. It's just a very criminal tactic. The second kind of group we see is hacktivists. As, is everybody familiar with the term hacktivist? Yeah? So really what they're, what they're doing is they have a cause and they think by being able to deploy a malware campaign, deploy a ransomware campaign, that they can uh, create uh, clout for their cause, create clout for themselves, uh, and be able to do it all for a cause. Unfortunately, I think we see kind of a, a gray area between cyber criminals and hacktivists, but I think some cyber criminals think they're hacktivists, right? Um, but just to make a dollar, I don't think is a legitimate cause. And then the last one is nation state hackers. I think we all know who those are. We all know those countries where they come from. This is that third group that we really have to be focused on. This is really more centered around you know, government entities and the people that they're trying to get information around, specifically targeted at the US, um, to be able to understand how we're doing things, get secrets, um, and be able to, to crack the code of the things we're doing specifically with military and our policies and things like that. So uh, we're seeing those three groups. So this next slide, when I click here, you're going to see a bunch of articles pop up. And I have that done by intention. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them. But you'll see that ransomware, as I said earlier, is not going away. This is just a very small snapshot. And you probably have read a few of them as they popped up and are very familiar with some of these. I think one, the very first one that popped up, it talks about a patient that died uh, over in Europe because of ransomware. And what happened is the patient was actually in the ambulance being routed to the hospital. And in the time that that patient was being routed to the hospital, that hospital was hit with ransomware and they had to reroute the ambulance to a different hospital. And in the time that that happened, the patient actually died. If that's not impactful enough, just with the healthcare industry, but much less with the, the impact that ransomware can have, I don't know what is. Uh, it's very scary to think that a hacker can get into an environment, uh, can be able to deploy this ransomware, deploy the malware, and really affect patient care, if we talk specifically about healthcare. If we start talking about other industries, manufacturing, supply chain, all of these things that really make our economy flourish, if they go down, we have a big problem. Let's talk about the Colonial Pipeline for a second. We saw on the East Coast, and I think it started spreading a little bit further west as we uh, uh, were dealing with the Colonial Pipeline attack. Gas was 
hard hit, right? We had people that were filling up plastic bags, right? I don't know if you guys remember seeing that on the news, but they were literally putting gas in plastic bags. They thought they weren't going to be able to get gas because it really impacted that pipeline. It's one of the largest pipelines we have. And it impacted that pipeline so much just by somebody deploying ransomware. Uh, a couple other ones here that we talk about. Um, this last one was popped up back in March where the Homeland Security issued a statement regarding ransomware. I think we're gonna start really getting, if I kind of talk about thought leadership as we evolve with this history of ransomware and where we're at today and where we're going, I really believe that we're gonna start seeing the government getting much more involved with policy in regards to how these things are handled within our companies. Uh, it's, it's not a secret that you know, politics has its place in our country, uh, but unfortunately I think that there's gonna have to be some controls that are applied by the government as we go forward, whether we like it or not, just because we gotta make sure that we mitigate these risks. All right, so why is it that we need to prioritize ransomware defense? Well, one, ransomware payment, right? None of us want to make the payment. Unfortunately, though, I think some people feel that it's better to just make the payment and be able to move on and get their data back. The, the downside to that is you don't know that you're going to, one, get your data back, and two, even if you get it back, you don't know that you're actually going to be able to recover it. So I don't know that we really want to pay the ransom. We definitely don't want to pay the ransom. So we need to focus on the defense tactics to make sure that we are not getting ransomware. What types of things can we do? And it's so basic as to patching your systems, upgrading legacy systems, right? It's some of the basics that we all know as IT practitioners, much less cybersecurity practitioners, to make sure that we don't have to make these payments. Another one is business continuity, right? We wanna make sure that we have the ability to function our business. If we are getting attacked, it's gonna not only cost money, rather be from a payment or from operational costs to be able to recover, but really you're down, right? If you're, a, let's talk about maybe a, a financial firm, right, that gets attacked, their downtime is dollars. Really any company, their downtime is dollars. And if you start correlating that together, you're really gonna make the case for yourself to your board, your executives to say, okay, let's just defend against it. And then we won't hopefully have the problem, right? I think we've kind of coined the phrase of cybersecurity, it's not a matter of if, but when. Um, at this point, I feel if we haven't been attacked, we're just lucky. Um, and it's unfortunate, and it's kind of grim to say that, but it's really the truth. So if we call, a couple other things we talked about, I mentioned um, IT costs in general, IR costs as well. One thing that we do here at Cyber Reason is we have an IR retainer that you can purchase and we can put boots on the ground in the event that you have an incident. There's many companies that do that, but that costs you money. Being able to have not only your own IR team that's running, doing investigations, trying to be proactive, but if you need that advanced level support from a vendor like Cyber Reason, it does cost money. Insurance coverage is another one too. I think we're seeing cyber insurance as a, a pretty hot commodity these days. That also costs money. But then we can start talking about what are things that are non-monetary? Your reputation, your intellectual property. Those, aren't, those don't necessarily have a direct correlated dollar value, but they can be a huge hindrance to your business. And so you wanna make sure you're defending against that as well, because that intellectual property, that reputation is really what matters for you as a company. Regulatory fines is another one uh, with the advent of GDPR, CCPA, I think New York is in process of uh, issuing one as well. When you have these regulations that are coming up around data, around access to that data and what you and this company have to do, uh, you wanna make sure that that data is defended because again, your customer data, your intellectual property, that's what's important and you wanna make sure you defend against it. And then last but not least, we already talked about loss of human life. We specifically talked about the healthcare industry. Uh, as you know, if there's, is there any healthcare workers in the room right now by chance? No healthcare? You guys probably all know, I spent a long time in the healthcare industry uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. And one thing that we saw a lot, and I think it's that way probably in manufacturing as well and probably some other industries, but we saw legacy systems. And legacy systems is an absolute downfall to cybersecurity. So if you have legacy systems, my little piece of advice, let's get them upgraded. Uh, getting them upgraded will help mitigate some of that risk. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about insights and trends. What are we seeing with ransomware? How is it evolving and, um, and what are we doing about it? So this is ransomware. I'm gonna take this out. Is that okay with everybody? I don't feel like standing still. Just come out. There we go. Yeah, is that better? I wanna move around a little bit. So if we talk about um, single stage ransomware, what happens, they get into your system, right? Whether that be through a phishing attack, uh, drive-by download, some sort of vulnerability in, let's say, Office or Adobe or some other. They get into your environment and then they find a way to be persistent. Is there anybody that can tell me what it means for an attacker to be persistent in their environment? I would say I have a gift card to give you if you can give me the answer, but I don't have one. So, anybody? Persistence? Yes. Perfect. Perfect example. So, I agree with so the ability to stay in your environment no matter what you do, right? So reboots for example. Okay, well, you know what? Let's just try to reboot everything. Let's reboot these servers and hope, well, they've found a way through a DLL or some other, they've gotten into a service account, they've done something to where then they can still survive no matter what try to, mitigation you try to take. Then at some point, they detonate, right? Whether that be immediately, or we're seeing a lot of custom packers nowadays too, where they're deploying it, you wouldn't even recognize it as malware until 10 minutes, or 10 hours, or three days, or 60 days. I think the average dwell time uh, latest report is around 60 days of an attacker that should be sitting in your environment. You have no idea they're there. Stale accounts, right? Make sure we're cleaning up stale accounts. So when they detonate, then they encrypt, once they encrypt, then they attempt to get you to pay that ransom, right? So that's a single stage ransomware. That's what we saw early on. It could still happen, but really what's happening is these attackers are getting much more advanced. So as you can see here, there's a couple of yellow blurbs here that show you that they're doing a lot more now. So not only are they getting your environment, they're staying persistent, but then once they're persistent, they're moving laterally, they're getting you to connect out to a command and control server. They're accessing uh, privileged accounts, getting access beyond their initial uh, infiltration, stealing those credentials, keeping them, continuing to stay persistent. Then they're detonating, right? Encrypting, going across multiple machines, making it operate much like a worm to where they're not just doing one machine and one user or a group, they're trying to go across the entire enterprise and crawl them. Then again, hope that you pay the ransom. But then we're seeing this new mantra from the adversaries. And then it's not only are they trying to get you to pay the ransom and make money that way, they're also selling your data. So now they're double extorting you. So now you're kind of out of luck from two perspectives. Okay, so now you paid the ransom, you got your data back, let's say you're unable to unencrypt it all and you get it all and you recover, but now it's out there. It's been sold to the highest bidder. So now, again, you're in a place where you're just kind of stuck and you don't know what to do. So go back to that, how do we defend? We need to defend these environments. We need to make sure that we deploy tools and have people that are trained and well knowledgeable to defend your environment. So I talked about this briefly earlier. I think I mentioned um, uh, spray and pray briefly, but earlier, like pre-2016, really what we saw was the ability for uh, a threat actor to target a company, target an individual, whoever they could get their hands on and try to get them to pay a ransom, right? Spray and pray, just put it out there and then hope that somebody pays a ransom. A lot of that spray and pray technique, though, was centered more around the individual. Not to say they weren't targeting companies, but a lot of times they were targeting individuals. The problem with targeting individuals, like us, as our, you know, at our home, one, a lot of times you don't know that those individuals have the ability to pay, right? So you have Joe, user at home, do they even have the funds to be able to pay the ransom? And is it really important data enough for them to want to pay the ransom, or can they just start over fresh, right? But when they were attacking organizations, it was kind of the same way. They weren't really 
trying to aim at anybody in particular. They were really just doing that spray and pray technique and hoping that they got a company that's big enough that's willing to pay the ransom. Well, as we've evolved, uh, as the threat actors evolved, they've actually started doing targeted campaigns, right? Now they are going after company A and company B and company C because they know they have the money. They know they have important data that now they can blackmail and sell the highest bidder and double extort them and get double the funds, right? Between 2019 and 2020, little point here, the average ransom payment tripled. I'm gonna repeat that again. The average ransom payment in one year between 2019 and 2020 tripled. I don't know what it is in 2021 yet. We're not there yet. I would venture to assume, so you can see that blue line, it's probably gone up again. So again, it just really goes back to make sure that we do the basics. Make sure we defend our environments. We don't want ransomware to get in because then we have to deal with it. And if we can avoid dealing with it, we're gonna be much better off. Um, the other point here is just that the attacks have definitely increased. Since 2016, back with uh, WannaCry, NotPetya and things, we've just continued to see the evolve, evolution of ransomware being a problem. If you remember back to that timeline that I showed you at the very beginning, you can see between 2016 and now how many bullets were on that timeline. And that's just a few, right? That's just a little snippet of some of the big ones. So it's getting worse. It's a problem that's not going away. So let's talk about the targets. What makes a good target for a ransomware attack? Anybody got an idea? No patching on the machine. What's that? No patching on the machine. No patching? Critical infrastructure and money. Critical infrastructure, potential money, so companies that have loads of it and let's encrypt their data and see if they'll pay it, right? Anybody else? I like this to be interactive. Sorry to put you on the spot. Those who require 99% uptime, critical infrastructure, bingo, right? If you need 99% uptime, which I think probably just about every business these days needs that, that's a great attack vector, right? If you can make them have downtime, what are they gonna wanna do? Pay you off, right? Second one, small IT teams. I see this far too often. Not only is it small IT teams, but it's really small cybersecurity teams. I think on average, if I, on a good day, I talk to a customer and they've got 10 cyber people. I mean, I talk to some customers, they've got 50, they've got 100, right? And I'm like, yeah, you guys are mature. And then I start talking to them and realize, okay, we've got some work to do. But that's okay. That's what I'm here for, right? But small IT teams, small cybersecurity teams is a detriment. Unfortunately, we are in a deficit in our industry. There's not enough of us to go around. Right? I think we all know that. But just running really lean, you're not gonna really be able to apply the defense you need to apply. So threat actors know that, they're gonna attack that. If you don't have enough people to do proactive threat hunting, 24-7, 365, call Cyber Reason, we can do it for you. That was my plug, that was my sales pitch for the day. You like that? All right, uh, and I never claim to be funny, by the way, so please don't feel like you have to laugh at my jokes. Um, those who use legacy systems, we already talked about this. XP, Server 2003, Server 2008. Let's get upgraded, guys. Let's get it to where we have infrastructure that is up to date and makes sense to use in 2021, right? So that's what makes a good target. Well, once they've identified their target, then they gotta know how they're gonna go and do it. Well, how do they do it? Ironically, what they're doing today is they're going buying how to do it. Most of these threat actors we're seeing are not the guys you expect sitting behind a keyboard, in their hoodie, in the corner, in the dark, writing code and deploying it to your enterprise. Most of what we're seeing is those people aren't actually deploying it, they're selling it. Once they sell it, somebody can go and run a ransomware campaign. It's called RAS. Ransomware as a service. The unfortunate side of this is they're giving them everything they need. 
They're giving them the tactics, the techniques. They're giving them technical support. They're giving them the tools. They're giving them everything for just a small amount of money. If you look at these screenshots I have up here, $389? I mean, that's not much. But then the next screenshot's even worse. It's only $65. Now, there's probably a big variation. I don't know these particular two off the top of my head, but it's funny, it says get Philadelphia at a special price. But it's just a few hundred dollars, right? And they're able to buy ransomware, buy a whole campaign, and get into your environment. Again, it's not that person sitting in the corner. That person sitting in the corner, they're the ones that are selling it. They're making their money by giving you the service or giving them a threat after the service. So then as we talked about earlier too, we're seeing this paradigm shift where it's not deploy ransomware and get somebody to pay the ransom necessarily. That's good. Maybe they will, maybe they won't, right? Maybe we say it's a million dollars for you to have to pay the ransom and you negotiate with them and they pay you 300,000. Fine, whatever, 300,000, cool. But really what's happening is on the backside, they're going and selling that data. And that's really nowadays what's worth the money. Think about PII, we've talked about healthcare several times. Think about PII, patient data in healthcare environment and what that costs. And to be able to access to that data, I mean, you really can hold someone ransom. If you think about intellectual property, source code, that's worth way more on the dark web than potentially what you're gonna get the company to pay in ransom, if they even pay it. Maybe they have cyber insurance. That's another form of, of attack too, where they're focusing on companies that they know have cyber insurance because they know they're gonna get paid. Maybe they're not gonna get paid everything they're, they're demanding, but that insurance coverage, they're gonna get some sort of payment. I think I touched on all those points. I don't want to sit here and focus on every one of them. Uh, the legal ramifications too, I think is a big one. Um, you know, we talked about earlier that unfortunately, I think, at least for now, we're gonna start seeing, I think, again, in my prediction and, and research I've done, some government interference in this, whether we like it or not, um, because I think there's gonna to need to be some policy and regulation around cyber around ransomware in particular. We're already seeing some of that, right, evolve. Uh, seeing some of that go to the Senate floor and things like that where those types of bills and stuff are getting passed or looking to get passed. Yep, go ahead. And you're exactly right, and that's a, a great point. In that respect, then, I think that we're probably in a two-fold approach. Uh, government runs slow, right? So I think that that's no secret, and so that's probably some of it. But yeah, that's a great point, that cyber insurance, much like life insurance, I think life insurance is much the same way. You have to meet certain thresholds. You can't be a smoker. You can't, you know, you have to be under a certain age, you know, all that, or your premium goes up. So yeah, uh, great point. Thank you. not renew you at all. Wow. I want to talk more about the Consent Cyber Reason booth. So, again, talking about government, right? So, paying the ransom. We're going to start seeing some uh, potential government type things come out. This one in particular, the screenshots around um, that ransom payments could potentially at some point um, violate anti-money laundering laws um, and some other laws that are already in place. They're kind of finding, I feel like, a little bit of a loophole um, to be able to tell people that they're violating some sort of policy that already exists um, because they're paying the ransom. So uh, I think we're going to continue to see more things evolve there. 
So before this slide, um, me and, and several others in my company have presented this similar deck. Uh, we all have our own way that we present it, but um, it was 2020, the year of ransomware. I put a question mark behind it because I don't know that we know 2020 is the year of ransomware anymore because 2021 shaped it up to be a competitor. So, but let's look about it. Um, ransomware is the most aggressive that it's been in 2020. We've seen, and now into 2021, we've seen where it's really prominent, it's very aggressive, and we're seeing these attack campaigns happening and flourishing, and companies are having to do something about it, whether pay the ransom, cash under cyber insurance, get boots on the ground with an IR retainer, do investigations, things like that, all of which are very costly. As I mentioned earlier, we're seeing a paradigm shift. We're seeing ransomware not just be an infection, pay the ransom, we unencrypt, or we give you the key, right? We're now seeing, okay, you do all that, but while you're doing that, we're also gonna sell all your data to the highest bidder and make that money as well. So we're seeing this huge paradigm shift. One thing that's very interesting to me, and I'm actually in the process of doing some research around this um, for kind of an internal project that I'm doing, and it's joint ventures between threat groups we're seeing where threat actors are actually working together now. And that's pretty scary if you think about it because you have somebody that specializes in one thing and another person specializes in another thing and they're joining forces. The only thing that can come out of that is more evil, right? And so we're seeing where they are collaborating, they're taking what they've done in the past, they're evolving it, they're getting techniques from their friends, and evolving it, and making it to where it really is a joint operation between these third actors. And the last one here, you know, we're we're just seeing the, the very common vectors that they're attacking. Phishing, right? I'm gonna dare to ask this question to see if anybody raises their hand. Who has fallen for a phishing campaign in this room? Yeah, I'll admit it, I have. I did earlier this year. <laughs> Ad suffers. Oops. Uh, it was legit. I mean, it looked so good. Uh, a couple days later, we got an email from our chief security officer. Hey guys, this was a test. Oh, man, I failed the test. Um, so I went on the you know on the naughty list. It is what it is. Nothing happened, but I mean, it looked legitimate. I I can't recall exactly what the email was, but I fell for it. That's probably once, uh, maybe two or three times that I've actually done it, but the average user falls for phishing emails a lot. Um, SMS phishing is kind of that new evolution. People are getting these text messages. I got blown up last week with these crazy text messages. And I'm like, what are these? How are these people getting my number, you know? So I'm asking all these crazy questions because I'm getting these random text messages. Hey, click this link. Oh. Earlier this week, quick little anecdote for you, a buddy of mine sent me a bunch of YouTube links, and it was weird because I have an iPhone, and on the on the preview, it didn't, a lot of times it will show like the, the first little snippet of the video, just like a still of that video. It just said, tap to download preview. And I'm like, why are you sending me this? So I text him, I was like, what is it? He's like, dude, they're all legitimate. And I'm like, I'm still not clicking on them. Like, I trust you, but I'm still not clicking on them, right? Like, I just, I'm too paranoid. It's funny, I've actually made my wife paranoid because she now doesn't click on things too unless she asks me, which is very good. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, vulnerable assets, right? Legacy operating systems, stale accounts. Please clean up Active Directory, guys. Somebody leaves the company, delete their account, get it out of there. Don't let the threat actor have a vector to get in. That's easy. Harder, harder said than that, what was that? Workflows, automation, ding, 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 word of the day, yes. Automation, that's awesome. So, as I'm kind of coming up on time here, I wanna make sure I get through all of this stuff here. So, what was impacted, right? Manufacturing, healthcare, what else is up there? Education, all the common industries that we know of. And then, just quick blurb, what's interesting here is you don't see, well, you don't see Latin America really lit up or Africa, which, I have my own theories around that, but notice you don't see Eastern Europe lit up. A little nudge, nudge, wink, wink. But you see Western Europe, you see America, you see Australia.
So one thing I want to touch on here real quick is, so this is actually um, information about what we did when it came to the eGregor ransomware. Um, so we saw that this was supposedly tied to the Maze Cartel, if anybody's familiar with that, uh, best we know. And it was, they are very well known for double extortion, right? So being able to uh, get somebody to click on a link uh, or drive by download and then be able to encrypt, but also once they get that data to sell it. Um, a lot of times it comes through a phishing email, installs Quackbot, and then actually launches the malware. Uh, one thing that we do at Cyber Reason really well is threat research. So we have a whole team called Nocturnus and Nocturnus every day in and out, that's what they do. They research intelligence, understanding what's happening in the environment, and so that's how we're able to get a lot of this information, even months before we see an attack, right? So making sure that we know who is out there doing what so we can apply those rules and our logic of our tool. So real quick here, malware as an attack, how does it happen, right? So if we look on the left-hand side here, you can see that there was an Excel process that uh, injected on a, the run DLL 32, which then launched Explorer, uh, which was the malicious process for uh, the tool called Cobalt Strike. So what they did here is they infected it, and then they were able to leverage a different tool to be able to take action. And they can do a myriad of things here, right? They can get to connect out to a command and control server, or they can uh, do lateral movement, right? And what they do a lot of times, once they get in in that capability and launch something like Cobalt Strike or Metasploit, then they use what we call living off the land techniques, right? Then they're using WMI, they're using PowerShell, using Visual Basic Scripts, whatever it is they can get their hands on to run those commands. And those are things that are in your environment on a daily basis that you have to have. So then you gotta start talking about, well, how do you harden these machines? How do you give users access to only the things they need? And it probably goes back to the automation piece, right? You're onboarding somebody, are they a sysadmin or are they in finance, right? So those are two completely different roles. This is a much bigger expanded view of um, how we saw a Gregor. This is actually a snippet from our, our what we call an attack tree. Um, so you can see here that this was a phishing attack, um, came in through the Chrome process, uh, installed the TrickBot downloader, um, and then eventually had the infection. And once that infection happened, at some point that threat actor is actually hands on keyboard, issuing commands through things like PowerShell Empire or Cobalt Strike, uh, Metasploit. Right? And that's where they're actually getting in and doing the, the dirty work, as I like to call it, right? They've gotten to where they need to be from a, a service campaign or from the malware, the commodity malware they got. Now they're gonna go and do that dirty work. And they do hands-on keyboard, and they do a lot of things. Notice how there's a bunch of stuff on the right-hand side lit up in red. That's all malicious in some form or fashion. So we here at Cyber Reason tag all of that in the console for you to see how things are uh, malicious solely based on the color. Um, and then you can click into each one of those and really do an investigation and understand what happened before and after to really get that understanding of visibility. Um, you can see on the left-hand side here, that was the, uh, the phishing link. Click on your bonus, the bonus report. Yeah, click on your annual bonus report. Got a lot of users in your environment that would click on that, don't you? Sure you do. Sure, if I got one that said, here's your commission statement, I would think twice about clicking on it. Um, so yeah, so making it very easy for these third actors to do what they do. But again, we have the tools, we have the tactics, we have the techniques to defend against it. So I'm gonna wrap up here, and then we can open it up for questions, we can open it up for discussion, whatever you guys want to do to move forward. But what are we, what are we challenged with today? Well, as I mentioned earlier, ransomware as a service, RAS. You can go buy a campaign. You can go do it right now. You can go buy a campaign and issue power. It's so easy to do. There's a lot of threat actors out there that are focusing on very specific organizations, targeted attacks. It's not spray and pray anymore. They're really focusing on organizations 
that have the money, that have the clout, that have the IP, that have whatever, you know, whatever it is that they're wanting to encrypt it, to sell it, and to make money off of these organizations. There's been a lot of payouts, unfortunately. As more payouts happen, price goes up, right? Supply and demand, it's pretty easy. Ransomware has moved to blackmail to where they're telling you not only do you have to pay, but if you don't pay, we're still gonna go make money off of you anyway. And then as we talked about several times, government regulations, potentially insurance companies, that are really just putting their foot down. Good news is, there's some upside, right? It's pretty low and slow. These threat actors sit there. There is time for you to defend against it, even if they get in. You just gotta have the tools and the people to be able to understand how these threat actors are evolving and to be able to proactively hunt. But they're sitting there for a while. We've got time before the actual material damage occurs. Another upside is most malware campaigns are not novel. These are not new. They're using the same tactics, the same techniques. We know how they're doing it. We just gotta defend it better. There's a lot of effective techniques out there that we're using, next, genera next generation antivirus, um, things around behavior-based technologies to understand, okay, someone goes to you know this IP in Iowa every day and all of a sudden they have an IP that they're connected to in Russia. Okay, something's wrong. Let's alert on it, let's figure out what's happening, and let's try to run that investigation, stop it before it causes that material damage. And then we talked about the very beginning, just overall good hygiene, right? Clean up stale accounts, update legacy systems, figure out what you need to do for your perimeter defense. You know, I said perimeter defense, it's probably a touchy subject with a lot of people. What is the perimeter now? We don't know. Perimeter's gone to the cloud. People are working remote. How do you do it? And we start talking about a lot of other things I could go way deeper on than ransomware with zero trust, the secure access service edge, and all these other things that we all know about that we probably talk about every day. But there are things that we can do to have good hygiene in our environment. So those are some upsides. A couple of points here to protect your organization. What are your crown jewels? Unfortunately, I talk to a lot of customers that they don't know the answer to that question. If we think about it from a family perspective, right, at our house, what are our crown jewels, right? Probably in a safe, right? It's your passport, it's your stockpile of cash. I'm from Texas, it's probably your guns, right? The kids, right? Those are your crown, those are the things you want to defend against if someone were to get into your house, right? We need to do the same thing with our environments. Reduce our cyber risk. Again, I'm talking about updating legacy systems. Prevent the preventable. It's huge, guys, huge. If something's preventable, prevent it. We at Cyber Reason are a firm believer in that. We are very good at detection and response, but we also have a prevention stack because if you can prevent it, let's prevent it. Let's write a signature for it if it's known. If it's unknown, let's use behavior. Let's understand what's happening. Let's prevent it so that way it doesn't even happen. Having a detection mindset, understanding what is going on in your environment at all times. User training. Does anybody have a security awareness program at their company? Yeah? Pretty effective? Mostly, kinda, sorta? You track it? It's <laughs> a good point. But the users, you know, I think we always like to see, or like to say that, you know, they're the that bottom chain of cybersecurity, right? They're the, the ones that are there doing the things, right? The cyber things. That was a nice little plug back too. Um, user training can be good. Uh, you just gotta do it the right way, you gotta track it. Um, I've actually talked to companies before that they've talked about how in the event that somebody falls for a phishing campaign, then they have to do some training. If it happens a second time, then something else happens, a third time, fourth time, whatever, that, then bonuses get taken. I've actually talked to companies where they've actually implemented policy to fire employees after so much. So I see some eyes over there. 
there must be a manager relationship sitting in the back. Um, we don't want to do that, guys. You know, we need the people. We need to run our business, but they've also got to have cyber in their mind, right? We got to make sure that we're evangelizing it, which goes hand in hand with communicating the risk of the business, making sure that the board, the C levels, understand the risk of the business. One company I worked with at one point in my career, and I have not, I don't know, I can't recall that I've seen it happen again, but the cybersecurity team, the CISO reported the CFO. And I was like, whoa, you're not in IT. You're in the financial sector now. Like you're, you're evangelizing the risk to the business from a pure financial perspective. Because the CFO cares about the money. They care about the bottom line. Well, how do you protect the bottom line? Well, you have good cybersecurity practices. And it was really cool to work with them and see how mature they were from a data protection perspective, from a threat prevention perspective, as they were uh, going through digital transformation, evolving to the cloud, the things they did, the, the vendors they chose, all that, because it was all a financial decision, but the CFO leaned on the cybersecurity team to make that financial decision. It wasn't just, oh, well, this is the cheapest, we're gonna buy it. Oh, this is good enough because we already own it. It truly was, how do we protect the business? I must have done this slide before because I already talked about executives. Wow, I'm just jumping ahead on myself here. Building relations with the executives is huge. Presenting at the board, presenting at the C levels, make sure they understand. And then last, prepare a peace time. When you've got downtime, when you're in between, when things are not happening, when things are going good for the company, that's when you need to have that detection mindset. Be proactive, understand what's going on in your environment, Threat hunt, implement technologies in your security staff that are going to make it easier for you down the road. Best time to prepare is when things aren't going bad, right? When things go bad, that's when everybody scrambles. So prepare in peace time. That's what I got for you guys today. Hopefully that gave you a little bit of insight. I went a little bit over my time, technically. Um, they really wanted me to be within 40 minutes. So we could ask questions, but now it's your turn. Questions, comments, concerns. Anybody? No. Wow. Okay. So. They may be. Yeah, they're up there for sure. Yeah, so MFA is a big one, guys. Um, I think we've seen that bit about that in several years. I don't, uh, I didn't actually mention that now that I think about it, but I think MFA is one of those big ones, right, to implement. It's not just prevention detection, but. MFA?
class. Good job. That's awesome. Those are good tips. Definitely reach out if he's if you need tips. He's got a lot of good ones. Um, I think that you touched on one thing with, with backups, and one thing I want to talk about real quick with ransomware. Um, please, guys, don't fall for the specific from an endpoint perspective that on Windows machines that there's a backup capability called VSS. Everybody know what that is? And that you can, oh, well, it's, it's backing everything up and you can just restore to that point. Unfortunately, what we're seeing, and a lot of our threat researchers are doing a lot of stuff with it right now to understand how threat actors are evolving in this space, but they're actually deploying malware that disables VSS. So even if there's a shot in the dark that you can use that backup from that shadow copy, likely it's been disabled or deleted by the malware anyway. So just a little tidbit for you. Um, to leave your USB backups. Yeah, there's a lot of things they can do in the way that they develop these ransomware. So be careful when it comes to that because there's a lot of things that can happen that you may be promised. I'm not trying to wink, wink, nudge, nudge, but I am wink, wink, nudge, nudge. You know, just be careful, vet through what is being said and what's being told. Um, but backups is definitely a huge one. But that's also that you've gotten some cyber insurance. Is everybody dealing with cyber insurance right now? Is that a I know I've had conversations with customers around it, but I don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, but okay. The last thing I have, uh, what industries do we have here? I know we got K-12. Government? Computer services? Okay. Cyber? Anybody else? High-level industry? Any finance? No finance in here? Yeah. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I just I, I really think that we're we're in this as we called it on the slide that goes its golden age, right? It's it's getting worse. The problem's there. We need to do what we need to do to defend against it. Um, last plug I have. I promise I'd only do one. I'm gonna do two. If you need help, let me know. We got a booth outside. We can help. I'm done. <laughs>